All right, everyone, it is interview time, and we are here with repeat guest Emily Nagoski, PhD. And I have to say, well, we were already fangirls when Emily was on our show before. We are even more fangirls to this day because the more we learn about Emily's teachings, offerings, and um, uh, by the way, Emily's in our book, like in every chapter. <laughs> uh, You're probably the most heavily quoted yeah. in our book, for sure, yeah. besides Esther. But right, like, of course. come on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You both are a phenomenal human. So, yeah, we you can really... tell you're doing a good job by the company you keep. That sounds amazing yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, seriously. Uh, and yeah, what an honor to have you here on our show to share all of your lovely uh, messages, offerings, educations, um, you know, learnings with our listeners. And you already wrote such a monumental book, which we'll talk a little more about um, that book as well. But your new book, Come Together, and we're so excited to read it because it's is coming out soon. But before we do all of these fun things, can you tell us how you got to where you are today in the field of sexuality? Tell us a little bit more. Yes. So I started out as an undergraduate peer health educator. So I was a big nerd in high school, knew I'd be going to grad school for something, no idea what, but I knew I needed some volunteer work on my resume to look like a good grad school candidate. And a guy on my floor was pre-med and said, hey, come be a peer health educator with me. And I was like, I like health. Why not? So I did. I got trained to go into residence halls to talk about, you know, condoms, contraception and consent. And at the same time, I was getting a degree in psychology with minors in cognitive science and philosophy. And I loved the brain stuff. I sort of had an idea that I was going to be a clinical neuropsychologist, work with people with traumatic brain injury and stroke because I love the brain stuff. But man, the work I was doing as a sex educator and then as a sexual violence prevention educator and then as a sexual violence crisis responder, that work made me like who I am as a human being in a way that the brain stuff never could. So that is the path I chose. I still use the brain stuff all the time, obviously, but uh, being in the field of sexuality it is what makes me feel fulfilled as a human being, not just intellectually. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Your voice is so comforting to me. I listened to <laughs> the Come As You Are audiobook, mm -hmm. I think, three and a half times because the, the half was, I yes, because over the years I got it and then it was interesting and then I go back and then I needed to go back more. And so it was great. And then I saw you, you did, I think you've done a couple of bits um, talking about pleasure on Netflix, at least one series. I can remember what was the name of yeah. it. It was, um, oh, I can never remember. They are so pleasure many. Principle? Pleasure Principle? Pleasure Principle. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was it. There was one more I thought too, but anyway, I was like, oh, I love Emily. So I'm so stoked that you're back on the show to talk about this really great book that I haven't even read yet, but I'm making a lot of assumptions based on what we kind of know that you're great at talking about. And now it's it's a mixture of of all the bits. So you're new, you're a New York Times bestseller. So, which was Come As You Are, that book. Incredible. <laughs> yeah, throw that hair down. Yeah. Toss that hair back. <laughs> it was revolutionary. It not only changed my life, it's changed the world, I think, for for the better. So wow. what inspired you to write Come Together? Which thank you for <laughs> yeah, those. I also. Knew you did yeah, I too. <laughs> yeah. So I wrote Come As You Are over a few years and you, you might, I mean, I don't know what your experience was of writing a book, but the stress of thinking and talking and writing and reading about sex all the time was actually so stressful that it destroyed all interest I had in actually having any sex. Mm. So like for months, mm -hmm. nothing. So here I am, this expert, I'm writing a book about sexuality, nothing is happening. And then I went on book tour and travel all over and talking to anyone who will listen about the science of women's sexual well-being. And again, so stressed out, nothing. I would try to follow my own advice, right? You've heard my advice, responsive desire. You don't wait for the mood. You set up a time, you put your body in the bed, you let your skin touch your partner's skin. And most of the time, what happens is your body goes, oh, wait, I really like this. I really like this person. But I was so stressed and overwhelmed and exhausted that I would put my body in the bed, let my skin touch my partner's skin, and just cry and fall asleep. And I thought, so I need more help than I have given in Come As You Are. So I did what anyone would do. I turned to the peer-reviewed science on couples who sustain a strong sexual connection over the long term. And what I learned there 
uh, turned my brain inside out and was basically the opposite of everything that I had ever heard in mainstream sex advice about sex for couples in long-term relationships. Mm. And I was like, why isn't anyone talking about this? And I realized, oh, I should probably, I should probably talk about that. <laughs> Thank ding, goodness. Ding, yeah. Yes, yes absolutely. Oh, oh, I, so I've had that, um, not, I wasn't called a moment, but you know, as a, as a sex educator, sex and relationship coach, having zero sex drive for two years and I was in a relationship. I, later I learned that I just need to leave that relationship and I'm not, that's not what you're talking about for yourself. But, um, so I wasn't stressed. It was more like, um, I'm not recognizing that this relationship isn't help isn't supporting me. And so mm -hmm. I was shut down mm -hmm. and it's so frustrating because like, I know the tools I'm trying the tools. They're not working. So that to me is an indication like, okay, there's something else going on. And I just want to also say right. in between these two books, you wrote a, you co-authored a book with your sister burnout. So right. <laughs> that is, so it was burnout inspired from, from that, like, as like, whoa, I yeah blew my fuses. So burnout was the next book because as I was, you know, traveling around talking to anyone who would listen about the science of women's sexual well-being, people kept coming up to me after those talks and saying, yeah, yeah, all that sex science is great. Thank you for that. But you know what changed everything for me was that one chapter about stress and emotions. That was everything. And I was surprised. Like, I put a lot of work into the sex science, but people are really loving the stress section. So I said that to Amelia, who is my identical twin sister. She's a professional musician. And she said, yeah, no shit. Do you remember when you taught me that stuff and how it, you know, saved my life? She said twice, she said. And I was like, yeah, we should, we should write a book about that. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm so glad that you did your again, like and, and your, yeah, props to your sister, too. Thank you, sister. OK, so why do you think sex in long term relationships is so heavily misunderstood? Like, why is that a thing? So it's brand new historically that we think about long term relationships as something happening between true peers. Legally, it is brand freaking new, shorter than my lifespan that legally Married people in a heterosexual relationship are actual legal peers that like where both of their willingness and interest to have sex with each other matters. So fast forward 30 seconds if you don't want to hear a dark fact. Do you know when in the United States the last state mostly made marital rape illegal? Wasn't it like in the last decade or something? It was 1992. Okay, oh, last man. couple of decades, but still. Yeah. Still. And in in some places, it's like a lesser crime. Wow. Right. Like yeah. it is yeah. brand new mm -hmm. that we live in a world where a long term relationship defined so often as marriage is about equal partnership and both people being equally interested in having sex with each other and needing to have both people willing, interested and enjoying the experience. Like, we don't have role models for how to create that. My mother's generation, I was born in the 70s. My mother was born in the 50s. My mother's generation did not get an education that taught them that they were equal sexual partners with their spouses. Mm -hmm. My generation barely got the idea that we were equal partners. My mother, when she got married, couldn't get a credit card in her own name without her husband's consent, right? Like, it's brand new. The reason it's a big deal is because we are now trying this wild idea of making sure everybody involved is glad to be there and free to leave with no unwanted consequences. It is so neat to be thinking and writing and talking about this topic at this moment in history because it's the first time, really, that we can talk about it as if everyone's opinion matters. And most people, most people are on board. Yes, your pleasure matters. Your consent matters. Your desire matters. Your experience of your erotic experience matters. At least in the Western world, yeah. hopefully, mm -hmm. because some countries aren't as evolved. And I think we have so far to go. Yes. But um, and, There's and hopefully plenty of places changes. in the United States where... Yeah. Yeah. Even in everything I just said would be condemned. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I feel very fortunate to live like where I live at this time to be able to speak what I want, need and, and desire. Uh, and how, yeah, it's it feels like an honor and a privilege. And I really hope that we can continue to spread that um, throughout the world.
over time. It takes people like you, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> so you're changing the world. And, um, and you. We're, we're, we're doing the best we can, too. But it, it does. We're doing it takes, it. Yes, mm-hmm. we are. And um, <laughs> to all of you listening, too, you are helping change the world, yes. too, by yeah. changing your own pleasure. So onwards with it. Thank you for that. I love that little bit of it's not darkness. I feel like it's light and it's the mic drop moment when you are speaking to the time. So it's 2023 right now, almost 2024. So yep. it, it, there's no time like right now. So let's do a little bit of a relationship myth busting. OK, mm-hmm. relationship myth busting time, everybody. What are the myths most people have been taught about sex, particularly when we're speaking to the LTR situation? Right. Okay. I'm going to start with a quick description of what's actually true about couples who sustain a sexual connection over the long term. There's three characteristics that they share. One, they have a really strong relationship. They're great friends. They trust and admire each other. Um, This is surprisingly controversial, but... It turns out that sex is better in a relationship when you really like the person that you're in a relationship with. Two, they prioritize sex. They decide that it matters for their relationship, that they stop doing all the other things they could be doing. Maybe you got kids to raise. Maybe you got a job to go to, a school to go to. You got a puppy to house train. You got a chronic illness to manage, friends and family to spend time with. Sometimes you, God forbid, just want to watch like some cozy mystery TV and then take a nap. Why would you stop doing all these things and just have sex? The couples who sustain a strong sexual connection, they may have seasons in their relationship when sex drops off the priority list. That is normal and part of what it is to be in a long-term relationship, but they find their way back to each other because it matters for their relationship. And the third characteristic, and I'll be honest, this is the difficult one, is that couples in these relationships spend their lives unlearning all of the bogus crap that they were taught from the day they were born about who they are supposed to be as sexual people and who their partner is supposed to be as a sexual person and what their relationship is supposed to look like as a sexual relationship. And they get rid of that stuff to create space for what is actually true for them as a sexual person, for their partner as a sexual person, and for them in a sexual relationship. So two of the biggest myths that with like, if I could just get rid of these two things, I think the world would be such a better place. One, did you guys absorb the idea that if you have to talk about sex in a relationship, that automatically means there's something wrong. There's a problem. If you have to talk about it, there's a problem. Oh, yeah. That was about, yeah, back in the day, for sure. Yeah, yeah totally. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, not anymore. Like, y'all have figured it out. Yeah. And yeah. like, so many people have this idea of like, I can't talk about it. That's like admitting there's a problem. The couples who sustain a strong sexual connection, who have not just a strong sexual connection over the long term, but have extraordinary, magnificent sex, talk about sex all the time. Mm -hmm. The second thing is uh, something that I call the desire imperative, which is this sort of narrative that I definitely... By the time I got to adulthood, I absolutely believed that like at the beginning of a relationship, there's this like fancy spark of something magical that happens between you and you like can't wait to like put your tongues in each other's mouths and you you get together in the long term and like that can last. That spark, it can last a while and eventually maybe like life gets complicated. Somebody loses a job. You get a fixer upper house. You have kids. Things happen and that spark goes away. And then you age. And by the time you get past menopause, you're just left to like drift away holding hands uh, (laughs) on the beach at sunset in a haze of like total lack of testosterone and estrogen, (laughs) apparently. (laughs) Right. And there's like, there's only, you're a raisin. Yeah. (laughs) Right. You're just like a totally non sexual raisin with a (laughs) dry freaking vagina. (laughs) <laughs> or whatever body part you happen to have. So uh, there's only two things you can do about this. Either you can like accept that your sexuality is just going to vanish eventually. Or, and for some people, they're like, Whew, don't have to worry about that anymore. And for them, cool. But, or you can fight, you can invest time and energy and even money in trying to keep the spark alive. If I could eliminate just one sentence from the English language, it would be, Keep the spark alive because the couples who sustain a strong sexual connection over the long term 
do not talk about Spark. You ask them for the top characteristics of an optimal sexual experience of magnificent sex. Desire is not on that list. Mm. They wow. do not talk about desire. What do they talk about instead? Pleasure. Mm. The couples mm. who sustain a strong sexual connection and who have wonderful sex have sex that they really enjoy having. It's not about how often they do it. It's not about where or with whom or in what position or even how many orgasms they have. It's just whether or not they like the sex they're having. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. So it's like the, the quality versus quantity a little bit, but like there's even more to quality. It's not exactly the, necessarily the quality of it, but you know, is like, are, are we enjoying it? Are we having pleasure? It's so it's not like, Oh, you had only had sex twice this month so therefore this is a bad thing because society says that you should have sex at least x amount of time it's how you quantify i'm just going to yeah. throw another cue in there yeah, right yeah give us all the cues yeah. yeah yeah and it's different for every person okay there's one specific point that i wanted to talk to you about because um, it kind of goes hand with like the lust thing and you were talking about like oh if i just get in bed with my partner and we just start like touching skin on skin then i'll feel the thing right so um mm -hmm. and we love the myth busting and we want the truth and we can handle the full truth and i would like more truth about spontaneous desire. So what do you know to be true more so than you did before about spontaneous desire in long-term relationships? Uh, spontaneous desire is not the thing. So spontaneous desire is normal and healthy. There is nothing wrong with spontaneous desire for sex. So spontaneous desire is the like hot and horny, heavy, can't wait to put my tongue in your mouth kind of feeling. Erica Moen, who illustrated Come As You Are, draws spontaneous desire as a lightning bolt to the mm -hmm. genitals. She draws kaboom. You just, you just want it out of the blue. And that is a normal, healthy experience. And also among the couples who sustain a strong sexual connection over the long term, that is not the experience of desire that characterizes their individual experiences or their relationship. Instead, their relationships are characterized more by responsive desire where they put it in the calendar. And I know scheduling is not for everyone. It can backfire badly sometimes. But imagine a circumstance where like, you know, we're busy. For me, if something matters, I put it in the calendar or else it might not happen, right? Like if I want to make sure it happens, it goes in the calendar. If I'm going to go see Timmy's play, it goes in the calendar so that I don't forget and do something else instead because like I, I got a lot of other things on my mind. So imagine a relationship where you put it in the calendar and you look forward to it and you show up and you do put your body in the bed and you have a great time. That's responsive desire. And that is much more descriptive of how couples sustain a strong sexual connection over the long term. Yeah, spontaneous sex absolutely can happen. Spontaneous desire absolutely does happen. And mostly, if you want spontaneous desire to happen, the way to do that is not to try to increase desire. It's to shape your context, your relationship and your internal state and all of your external circumstances in a way that makes it easy for your brain to access pleasure, which this is four chapters of the book that I have just said in one sentence. <laughs> so like it's not straight. It's not obvious how to do this. But when you prioritize pleasure, you put pleasure at the center of your definition of sexual well-being all the other pieces will fall into place. So for my example, I knew that if I could just get there, if I could somehow just like get to the right state of mind, the sex we would have would be great. We have very high quality, really fun, highly orgasmic sex. I'm, you know, confident hair flip in an mm -hmm. extraordinarily good relationship. That's, I mean, that's what I would expect from me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I learned how to have relationships about books on the science of how to have relationships. So I have an evidence-based relationship and it works. Mm -hmm. But like I couldn't. I was so stressed out and exhausted and overwhelmed and I was stuck and I had to be like, okay, so if I'm stuck, where am I stuck? And how do I get out of this stuck place and get to somewhere in the vicinity of the sexy place? And that is when I turned to the father of affective neuroscience, Jak Panksepp, who proposes a model of seven primary process emotions. Pause to note the bullshit that 2024, we still don't have like a single dominant model of how human emotion works. Wow. Like there's at least three major theoretical points of view. 
I chose Yak Pengseps because it's the only one that includes lust. Mm -hmm. So this is a model of how all mammalian emotions work. So in my brain, I've got like a mammalian monkey brain uh, that has a lust state that I can be in. And this is the state of mind that motivates courtship and sexual behaviors, right? Uh, and it's it's a little bit about reproduction, but for humans, the lust space is social. It is about connecting with this other person or just connecting with your erotic self if you're on your own. So I needed to get there. And I was in the fear space. I was stressed. I was in full like flight of fight or flight mode. I was like, running and pushing really hard and working really hard and feeling anxious and overwhelmed and worried and like, am I doing enough? Am I working hard enough? You know that feeling. You know that feeling. Mm -hmm. And so much so that I would show up, put my body in the bed, and my brain is in this fear state that is a million miles away from the lust space in my brain. So I had to learn how to get out of the fear space in my brain, which, you know, it's in chapter four of Come As You Are. It's chapter one of burnout, completing the stress response cycle. I know how to do that. But then I get out of the fear space. Cool. Where am I then? Well, Yak Pengsep suggests there are five additional spaces that I might be in, and three of them are pleasure favorable. And those are the spaces that I wanted to get to. Those are the ones that are going to have a doorway into the lust space. So, for example, play. This is the one that for a lot of people is like, oh, the play space for uh, mammalian motivation is the motivational system of friendship, where all kinds of play, object play, rough and tumble play, the main thing about play is that everyone involved is doing it for the fun of it. And there's nothing at stake. Nobody has anything to lose. A lot of people click into this when they're like, oh, vacation sex. Mm -hmm. It is when I can get away from all the other things that I'm all my obligations and responsibilities and roles and identities that are not compatible with the idea that I have nothing to lose. When I'm on vacation, I can relax and just play. So if the idea of like, oh, vacation sex resonates for you, maybe play that state of mind is one that is like, got a doorway directly into the lust space. It turned out that was like the space for me. So I practice recognizing I'm in the fear space or get myself out of the fear space, transition into a play space. And from there, into lust. The emotional floor plan, which is what I'm describing, takes me two chapters to describe. And I'm still learning how to like talk about it in a shorter way. So this is what qualifies as a short version of that answer. Did it work? Well, yes, yeah, totally. It's funny because when you were talking about in my brain, you were talking about scheduling things and putting them in your calendar. And you're like, I'm going to Timby's play. And the moment you said that, because that was a little bit back. And I was like, I wonder if you could trick your brain if you have problems uh, maybe this is your book too. I don't know yet. But if you have problems thinking about sex in your calendar, like it's date night, I know what that means. If you could trick your brain and be like, yeah. it's playtime, it's Emily's playtime. Mm -hmm. That's what like, because I would be like, yes. now I'd look forward to it because the moment and I thought about play because play sounds so fun to me. Like I'm just like, oh, we could do whatever. We could jump on the bed like children. Mm -hmm. we, yes. we could. Yes. Like we could wrestle. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't have to be sexy and serious. Yes. Oh, I want to live in a world where most of the sex we see on television and in porn has people giggling and rolling around and laughing instead of being so freaking serious. Like we are trained to believe that something terrible could happen if we are not already like perfect at sex, that like something could go terribly wrong. Like if a queef happens, instead of laughing because it's hilarious, we like worry that like, oh, no, the play state. Oh. Yes, I would like and but that's exactly so I talked to a queer menopausal woman who tried who like resisted scheduled sex for years in their relationship. And finally, because like they were both stressed, like crawling out of their skin, stressed, they shifted the frame from being sex night or even date night to game night. Mm, yeah. And they got those those like silly pink dice where you're like roll in your like lick here to, like, touch lick there toes. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah. and it was very silly 
but it was fun and playful and it took all the pressure off. She told me that she thought that it would help them have sex more often and it didn't do that. But it did mean that even when both of them were just like maxed out stressed, they were still connecting with each other on a regular basis, maintaining that link, even if it's not in the way that they think they're supposed to maintain that link, they're staying connected with each other through the most difficult and trying times of their lives so that when their lives become more manageable, that connection is still there for them so that they can do the things that sort of are more in their model of what they're supposed to be doing. I love that. I love that. And wait, so I did have a question. I just wanted to say the play part and like connecting, tricking your brain into having fun with sex. And I think that was an <laughs> aha moment. So thank you for, for I don't think you can that. trick your brain. I think you just have uh, to really? actually have fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, trick your brain in your calendar. You know how you sometimes things are looming oh. and you see that date right. and you're like, oh, it's looming. It's a sex day. Scheduling doesn't work when that schedule feels like, when it's like the dentist appointment. You're like, oh. Like, I know I'm supposed the dent to. Dental I know the right yeah. thing you to do. lightning bolts and fun and fun like uh, emojis yeah. in it or yeah. something. Or you it's could be like uh, an our, our friend it, who wore a butt plug to the dentist instead, and it, it was playful because it was entertaining to her. But they didn't know she was wearing a butt plug. Just you know, tangent. <laughs> you know, whatever yeah. it takes to get through. <laughs> so, if scheduled sex feels like an obligation, don't schedule sex. If it feels like something to look forward to, schedule it. Okay. Okay. I love that. So we talk about play a lot too. And so this is where it comes to talking about sex and desire. So what are some of the best ways partners, especially when it's hard, and that was a great example with the client you talked about. So what ways can partners talk about sex and desire with each other? And what can people do if there's some mismatched desires and someone isn't in the mood? <laughs> yeah. That's another phrase I would and like, I love that you're like heavy air quotes in the mood. <laughs> yeah. No. And then you change the, the accent for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, this is chapter one, change the question from like, why won't you have sex with me? Or do you want to have sex with me? Or like, why do you keep pestering me for sex? You know, those conversations. The reframe is what is it that you want when you want sex with a partner? Spoiler, it's not orgasm. Probably you can do that on your own. And if you can't do that on your own, there's whole books just about that. And lots of sex toys. <laughs> yeah. So many sex toys. Mm -hmm. So much porn, right? Like opportunities are available. So what is it that you want when you want sex with a partner? When I ask, I have asked a few thousand people this question, uh, both in person and online. And there's four big themes that come up. The first theme is connection. People want to feel connected to a certain special someone in their life. And sex is one of the ways that humans do that. There are lots of other ways that humans can experience connection. And I often recommend that if like sex isn't there for you, find a different way to access connection with this person. But a second thing they want is shared pleasure, specifically the because we don't just want the pleasure of like rubbing our body against someone else's body. We want the pleasure of rubbing our body against someone who really likes the experience of feeling our bodies rubbing together, that shared pleasure, witnessing someone else's pleasure and having our own pleasure witnessed is a thing that we want when we want sex with another person. A third thing, feeling or being wanted by the other person. So a lot of us grew up being taught that certain parts of ourselves are disgusting or even dangerous, dirty, that make us unlovable. We want to feel that those parts of ourselves are beautiful and desirable and wantable and lovable, that we belong, that those parts of ourselves are welcome in this relationship without reservation. And the fourth major theme that people want, so connection, shared pleasure, being wanted, and freedom. So this is the experience of being able to shut the door on all the other stuff we have to worry about in our lives and just pay attention in the moment to the pleasurable things that are happening in the here and now, to be released from all of our stressors and all of the identities that don't fit with our erotic lives and just let ourselves enjoy these sensations in this moment. But there's even more than those four. People want to affirm their identities. They want to affirm their relationships. They want to make sure they feel like they're being a good partner to their partner. There are so many things that people want 
when they want sex. And this transforms the conversation from why won't you have sex with me to let's talk about what is it that you want when you want sex? And other partner, what is it that you don't want when you don't want sex? This is a place where a whole bunch of gender stuff can come up. Like, you know, if you were raised with a set of genitals that made everybody go, it's a boy, and they raised you as a boy, and you grew up to identify as a man, then you may have been taught that your ability to get someone else to let you put your penis inside them is part of how we measure your worth as a human being and whether or not you deserve to continue to breathe the air you breathe. And so when your partner says no to sex, they may just be saying, you know what, I'm too tired, no penis for me tonight, thanks, sorry. But what it can feel like is, no, actually, you're not quite worth the space you take up and you don't really deserve the air you breathe here on Earth. Mm -hmm. It can feel like a rejection of your whole personhood when it's not that at all. It's just the person had a really long day and needs eight hours of sleep before they can be interested in penis again. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? <laughs> totally. I love it. It, like, it sounds like, of course, this makes perfect sense. And yet, like, I think for a lot of people, like, huh, I never thought of it that way. But yeah, it's it uh, the, a lot sense. of the book is like, oh, uh, uh, obviously, <laughs> like, like uh, one of the main messages of the book is like, it's not dysfunctional not to want sex you don't like. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, obviously, of course. And yet, the number one reason why couples seek sex therapy is a desire differential. When really often what's happening is a pleasure differential. Partner A is like, I'd be fine if we never had sex again. Okay, so what kind of sex are you having? To quote therapist and researcher Peggy Kleinplatz, the sex these people are having is dismal and disappointing. It is not abnormal. It is not a disease not to want sex that you don't enjoy, sex you're doing just out of a sense of obligation, sex that you're having where you feel like you can't be your full self, sex that you're having where you feel like your pleasure doesn't matter. Of course you don't want that sex. So so these are the two sort of big situations. There's a situation like mine where like, I know the sex would be good if only I could get there. And my solution was to figure out how to get to the lust space in my brain by understanding what my emotional brain was actually made of and how to navigate my emotions. And then there's the couples where like, I don't even like the sex. And your job there is to figure out what kind of sex is worth wanting. Yeah, this I, I'm i already like everyone listening probably is like, how do I get this book? How do I get this book? And we'll get there in a little bit. You're almost there, everyone. But I want to make sure that we covered this because we talked about a little before the emotional floor plan, because right. it sounds really interesting to me. And I love like a good formula or idea or concept or like that. So how does an emotional floor plan show up in relationships and how can people learn about their partner's emotional floor plan? Yes. So the emotional floor plan is a metaphor for the actual different primary emotional states that exist in all mammalian brains. So you have a lust space. You probably have some feelings about your lust space and your lust space is unique. So think about like when you're in a sexy state of mind, if you get into a sexy state of mind, what does it feel like? How do you know you're in there? What happens in your body? What happens in your thoughts? What happens in your emotions when you're in that space? What pulls you into that space? Like, Once you've gotten there, what was happening right before you got there that pulled you into that space? And what moves you out of that space? These are questions we're going to ask about all of the spaces. I will not keep saying it over and over again. Mm -hmm. Then there's your play space, which is the mammalian system of friendship, where there's nothing at stake. You're just romping. Um, I So object play, we know that children engage in object play with their blocks and they put things in their mouths and they, they're like, what is this thing and what can I make this thing do? That's object play. Imagine oral sex as object play. What is this thing, your partner's genitals, and what can I make this thing do? That sense of like curious exploration, there's nothing at stake. You are just finding out what you can do with this in the way that children play with blocks. That's the play state. So what does it feel like in your body and your thoughts and your emotions when you're in that state? What pulls you into it and what pushes you out? The care space Mm -hmm. is so important and big that I'm not going to talk about it yet. The (laughs) seeking space. The seeking space is curiosity, exploration, adventure, adventure. 
experimentation. For me, it's intellectual. I love learning, reading, going to lectures. When I was in grad school, I exclusively dated other grad students, and we'd talk about each other's research all the time. And there's basically a slip and slide from <laughs> affective neuroscience to the lust room in my brain. My brain is not the same as other people's brains. But that's okay. Everyone's brain is different. I have friends who like sold all their stuff and traveled around the world together. Sounds like a nightmare to me. Like I would never <laughs> want to do that. But they loved it. Things went wrong all the time. And they got to solve, usually in countries where neither of them spoke the language, and they got to solve these problems together. And that adventure felt really like right next door to the sexy place for them. And, you know, they've got the kids to prove it now. So seeking, play, lust, and care. These are the pleasure-favorable spaces, but care is complicated. This is the attachment mechanism is one of the scientific words people use, but the actual name is just love. So if you imagine the care space is feeling cared for or you're caring for someone where you're like, you know, snuggling on the couch in front of the fire or you're holding hands and gazing across the dinner table on a special date. This is the caring for space. And for a lot of people, there is a doorway directly from that feeling cared for into the lust room. Not me. My brain is different from other people's. Everyone's brain is different. This is why you have to map your floor plan to figure out, like, is there a path directly from this feeling to the lust space? But care is complicated because I think of it as like an open floor plan room. There's like the living room of care where you're like snuggling on the couch. And then there's the kitchen of care where you're taking care of people's needs. This is where like child care, cleaning up messes, making sure people are dressed appropriately, taking care of. And when you feel like you are taking care of your partner, the way you would take care of a child or a patient, that often does not have a direct path from there to the hey sexy lady. But the complexity of the care space is why you hear some people talk about intimacy as the foundation of the erotic, right? Because that's the caring for. And other people talk about intimacy as the enemy of the erotic because that's the taking care of space. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It sure does. Yeah. I when, I, when I think, think of care, I'm also feeling like a safety component yes. that comes there when you have that foundation that for me is really important. Like I will not have sex drive if I don't feel safe. And, yep. and I don't have to be in love with you to feel safe. But if I don't feel like there's some part of me that's being cared for by you, by, by you, even like a casual sex partner, then yeah. like my pussy's offline. It's like, bye, see you later. It's not happening. See, I like the challenge. I don't need the care. <laughs> I'm like, oh, right. yeah. 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 So She's that's like, why everyone's play, brain play. is different. Yeah. Yeah. And when the you were safety. talking about Emily, the adventure yeah. of going around the world and selling all Everybody's your like, shit, I was that. like, my pussy just got wet thinking about it. Like I I love yeah. I love the adventure. And I was like, I just want to go to bed. Yeah. Where's my pajamas? Can I just lie down? I love that though. We're all so different. And I think that's, yeah. that's really beautiful. I can already like, tell your, your book is going to change relationships so with you. I mean, the come as you are already did so much. Like I, we cannot tell you enough how much it's done for our lives and all of our listeners and so many people that we know, sex educators as well. And so I'm so excited for, for come together. I just, I can I talk about for trust for a second. Because it's that safety thing. Sue Johnson, who's a therapist and researcher, talks about trust as the question, are you there for me? Yes. And yeah. R is actually an acronym for emotionally accessible, emotionally responsive, and emotionally engaged. So when you turn toward them with a feeling, they turn toward you in response and are present and there for you emotionally. And that's that safety that you're talking about, where you know that if you show up with a need of some kind, they're going to be there to help you as opposed to like ignoring you or, you know, that thing where you... <laughs> I've been married for 13 years. There's a thing where you go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you like have not heard what they've actually said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I talk a lot about the ways I am an inadequate wife in this book. Uh, to, <laughs> just to show, like, you have to have a sense of humor about each other. Find a way to make it playful because nobody's perfect. <laughs> No. And the ways that people are flawed are directly tied to the very best qualities about them. The reason I go, uh-huh, 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 is because I'm really tuned into something else, like I'm paying close attention to something, and I can't disengage my brain. 
But when I turn that attention to my partner, I am really, really tuned in and I can't disengage my brain from him. So the things that make me an inadequate wife also make me a really good wife. <laughs> I love that. I love that too. I'm that I'm kind of that way. I can't focus. I have to focus all of my attention on one thing at a time. And so I yeah. will actively listen to my partner. The funny thing is, he's kind of the uh-huh, uh-huh. And then he'll be talking to me and I'm completely it involved. Like I'm trying to bake something. And so you have to follow yeah. the recipe or I'm just like, I don't know, doing a million things at once. Literally like usually doing do. anything else. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and if I, if I, if I do the uh-huh, uh-huh, he's like, are you even listening to me? I'm like, no, I'm baking. I am baking and I'm, <laughs> right. I'm like, I can focus on you in just a minute. Let me get this thing in the oven. So right. I love that. And that's sometimes the, the challenge piece that I'm talking about where I do really believe that, especially because I'm a, in a relationship with a penis owning cis man, right? And we are so different. And I, it's just biological. Like I'm like, we are biologically so different, but that also is interesting to me. I like trying I to figure him out like a about Rub this. Rubik's cube. Y'all, yeah. Y'all, I love it. Y'all, it's not biological. It's are just the sure? fucking patriarchy. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. okay. waiting for you to because say Because <laughs> we have been trained literally since the day of our birth about who we're supposed to be based on something as arbitrary as the shape of our genitals. And you know from chapter one from Come As You Are that everybody's just got the same parts, just organized in a slightly different way. And yet we train people, if you got this package of genitals, then whether or not you're a good person can be measured by whether or not you can get your penis into somebody else's body. And if you have this set of genitals, then your value as a human can be measured by whether or not you are good at acquiescing and meeting other people's needs without regard to your own comfort, safety, well-being, or even your life. Yeah. It's all... So one of the chapters is, like, I call it the gender mirage because it looks so real. Like, it seems biological. And it's all just this shimmering mirage laid over top of actual human diversity. And then there's a whole second chapter specifically for heterosexual type relationships because I am really worried about the straights. Yeah. Straight people reliably in the research turn out to have less satisfying sex lives and less satisfying relationships because of these differences we've been trained to believe are innate in us mm -hmm. and inflexible. But oh boy, if you can find your way to your true self underneath all the gender garbage you got taught and your partner, you can find your way to their true self underneath all the gender garbage. It's not easy, but when you do it, that is the journey that ends in the kind of orgasms that make the universe turn into rainbows. Fuck yeah. It is I worth just thought it. The br it wasn't even the genitals. I thought the brain, their men's brains just stopped evolving and women just kept evolving. That's, I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, dude. Yeah. Stop. No, I'm yeah. sorry. I am just I'm kidding. Joking. <laughs> yeah. I say that to my partner sometimes. I'm like, are you sure that, you know, because he has three beautiful daughters too, and they're all just so great. And he's come a long way since I met him. I mean, he's 55 years old. And I'm like, I'm proud of you, but sometimes it's definitely the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's, that's why we, ha we have a lot Fucking of work patriarchy. to do still. <laughs> and I think reading a book like, well, both of your books or all of your books is a great start. So you can pre-order your book. I believe now you'll have to let folks yeah, um, available know. for pre-order everywhere. Books are sold and pre-order. Y'all, you know, we preached about this when we were releasing our book and pre-orders are really, really important. I'm going to actually pre-order your book after this show. And mm -hmm. so is it anywhere books are sold? And then how can people find you? I know you're you're actually doing a book tour. And I think it I starts am. in February mm -hmm. or March of 2024. So how can people find you, get the buy your book oh, nice. and get more of Emily Nagoski, PhD? So <laughs> if you're an audiobook person, I really recommend the audiobook of this one. I narrate on my audiobooks. It's the only thing I ask for in my book contracts. Um, and I'm really, I'm really proud of this one. So if you're an audiobook person, there's that. My website is just emilynagoski.com. And yes, I am going on tour. The book is released January 30th. The first event is in Brookline, Massachusetts on January 30th. I'm traveling on the East Coast, on the West Coast, and in the Midwest. I have not yet scheduled stuff in the South or the Southwest, but that will probably be coming later in the year. So, mm -hmm. and like, I am full of like the evangelical spirit of come together. I can't stop talking about it. I really think the book can like help people. Of course, writing this book about sex again, destroyed all interest I had in actually having any sex. 
But the amazing thing was at the end of it, I had this 100,000 word tome of like how to find my way back to my erotic self and to my partner. And I'll be completely honest, it's better now than it has been in our entire relationship because I'm yes. following my own freaking advice and it works. Yeah. It, oh my God. It, I think awesome. Because you're so exhausted. Like I felt that, and I don't know, I can't speak for Amy, but when I was writing the book, with Amy and you're a solo author. So I can't even imagine the amount of hours you had to put in. And Amy, I, I was just tired. I like my body hurt from being on my computer all the time. My brain was, it was just like mush. It's like I, that point I, where I you couldn't even like say a sentence it, at I the end of the day. I didn't yeah. ever, I not even master. And I like orgasm, self-induced or otherwise. And I couldn't yeah. even master. I was like, I am tired and I have other things to do. I don't want your creepy little mitts on me at all. Like, get away. <laughs> from yeah. Like, get off me right now. Sorry, partner. No, I love I got, them so I much. Nothing, I love you. Yeah. yeah. I got nothing for you. I know. Uh, I don't. Got, yeah. There's well, now we've come together. Maybe you'll figure out whatever your pathway is. And I think it might be play for you over there. A little playful chip. <laughs> oh, God. My sex life is amazing. Yeah. After the book was yeah. done. I mean, it went from. Yeah. It went, it turned itself around like doing backflips, right? But during, so yeah. I think Context. that it makes sense. Yeah. And using mm -hmm. your book is a great example of your own words mm -hmm. that actually helps. So thank you, Emily, for yeah. that. Thank you and so I'm not shaming my partner, by the way. I'm just, I'm being real yeah. about you know, creepy the, myths. the exhaustion. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. That's also just for drama. So yeah, I, I just know, said that for drama. Um, yeah. I love his myths. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very nice. I've touched them before too, actually. They're very nice. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, y'all. Uh, please Go check out Emily Nagoski's work. You will not be disappointed. Three and a half times is not a joke on, on Come As You Are. I read that book three and a half times. I love it. I'll probably read the other half soon. And come together. January 30th, pre-order now. Anywhere books are sold. Check out Emily Nagoski's work. She also um, had an eight, eight episode podcast that you can check out mm -hmm. called Come As You Are as well. So... Yeah, a lot of things, a lot of work for you to do, but it's a new year, new you, all of the, all of it. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> with that, I will see you all next Tuesday. Oh, I can't leave without asking your your help to give us reviews all over, all over. If you bought our book, review the book. It helps more people find Shameless Sex and all of the incredible educators, doctors, scholars, PhD beauties that are out there helping change the world. So uh, you can review us, our podcast too, and you don't have to write a novel, okay? You don't have the time. Just just use a couple of emojis. Uh, we love those. All right. We will see you next Tuesday. Ah, ciao for now.